Good morning. My name is Josh, and I get to serve as pastor here at Cowdersport. And uh, if you're worshiping with us the first time today, welcome. I'm super grateful that you're here. If you don't have a home church, we'd love to help you find one, even if it's not this one. There's a lot of great churches in town and um, in our community, and we believe that being a part of the body of Christ is like not just necessary, but vital. Does that make sense? You know that we all need that spiritual protection and covering that the body of Christ can provide. So love to help you find a church if you don't have one already. So this morning we're uh, just about midway through uh, our series entitled Spiritual Gifts. And I just want to offer um, a word of caution. And I'm doing this because I've gotten some really great feedback over this last uh, couple weeks. People asking really good questions, like make pastor think questions. So um, thanks for doing that. But one word of caution I have for you, um, I need to clarify that this spiritual gift survey is not the goal, okay? I just want to make it abundantly clear that this, this spiritual gift survey is not the goal of this series. Spiritual wholeness is the goal of this series. My hope is that, that this tool will kind of help us move towards spiritual wholeness, but it's flawed. It's not perfect. You can easily manipulate it. Like, if you just answer the question in certain ways, you'll be like, I got that one, right? Like, so, you know, want to be real careful. And I want to clarify that um, the disciples didn't have this. Just so everybody knows, um, I think the date on here is 2003. So a um, couple thousand years ago, the disciples did not have a spiritual gift survey. They didn't have a test. And the goal is not to get you to do the survey. The goal is not to get you to just like, you know, celebrate on social media about a survey you completed, right? Like I, that's, that's not the goal. The goal is spiritual wholeness. What the disciples did have that you and I still have is the Holy Spirit and the leadership of the church. Historically, that was the way that people discovered their spiritual gifts, was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the confirmation of the spiritual leaders in the context of the church. So if you don't like this survey, I don't particularly like it either, being honest with you. It's the best one I've found that I could offer to you in this season. But the survey is not the goal. The goal has always been and by God's grace will always be our spiritual wholeness. Second word of caution I want to give you. And this one is harder for me to say out loud, okay? Because I know our church set situation. I, like I, I know the setting. But the goal of this series, this is my second point, the goal of this series is not to get more volunteers. And I'm going to ask you to hold me to that, okay? The goal of this series isn't to get more volunteers. I'll be honest with you. The truth is we do have a lot of gaps in a lot of the places in the context of our church. There's needs in kids. There's needs in youth. There's needs in worship. There's needs in trustees and deacons and deaconesses. There's, there's needs in life groups, right? There, there are real and significant needs in the context of our church. And it would be easy, and I'll say, <laughs> giving you a peek inside of my soul, it would even be tempting for me to just like use this as a like, and don't forget to sign up to serve, right? By God's grace and my commitment to you is that this series isn't about a spiritual gift survey, and it's not about getting more leaders to serve. We need more leaders. But what we need more spiritually whole leaders, emotionally and relationally whole leaders, more than we need to fill a, slot, fill a slot. Because remember, the spiritual gifts have actually two purposes, and this is still part of, of my word of caution, right? The spiritual gifts, it'd be easy for, for anybody in the context of the church, you'd be like, hey, we need more leaders. Let's do a series on spiritual gifts. Let's get everybody involved, and, and the church will get better. I feel the same way, sweetheart. 
And it is totally okay. I'll go back to bed too. Um, so let me just reinforce for you, remind you of the definition of a spiritual gift. Because in the definition of a spiritual gift is clarity with regards to who it's for and why. Um, oh, yeah. I put these up here. There they are. There's my two words of caution. Number one, the spiritual gift survey is not the goal of the series. Spiritual wholeness is the goal. And number two, getting more church volunteers is not the goal. The goal, spiritual wholeness. Spiritual gifts are supernatural empowerments given by the Holy Spirit to followers of Christ so that they can do the work of building up the body of Christ and, capital A, capital N, capital D, and extend the kingdom of God throughout the world. So spiritual gifts are not just for the church. So it would be foolish of me to just think that, that doing a, a series on spiritual gifts is going to fix all our leadership vacuum issues in the context of our church. Because what the Holy Spirit wants to give to you, and what the Holy Spirit wants to give to me, and what the Holy Spirit wants to give to our community is spiritual wholeness. Gifts that can be used in the church and in the community. We good? Questions? Concerns? Observations? Shoot me a text, email, Facebook message. I don't like those, but you can do it. Just want to be super clear. It's, it's not about getting more church volunteers. It's not about completing a survey. It's about spiritual wholeness. Okay, so this week, um, the title of the sermon is The Shadow Side of Spiritual Gifts. And I'll be honest with you, um, this is a sermon I don't really want to preach. So if somebody wants to do something else instead this morning, you can come up and we can just, I'll trade you. But all week long, I just haven't gotten away from, from this. Like, I just felt like God whispering and, and sometimes screaming and sometimes kind of pounding into my soul. The need to be really careful here. Because spiritual gifts do get abused. In the context of the church. Spiritual gifts get misused in the context of the church. Spiritual gifts get neglected in the context of the church. And I wish I didn't have to preach this sermon. I've tried to get out of it all week. But here we stand. And I believe what God wants to give to us this morning is some clarity and, and a framework for those of us who've been part of churches or will in the future be a part of a church that either abuses, misuses, or neglects the spiritual gifts. No church is perfect, dear friends. And if you're looking for a perfect church, you won't find it this side of heaven. The only perfect church is the one that Jesus will call unto himself one day when he calls time on the world and returns for his bride. And so I have to just, I feel compelled to be honest with you that in the context of the local church, spiritual gifts get abused, misused, and neglected on a regular basis. And I believe it hurts God's heart I believe that it has a tendency to quench the Holy Spirit, and I believe that there are people in this room today that have been hurt because of the abuse, misuse, and neglect of the spiritual gifts in the context of the local church. And my heart aches for you. My heart aches for you. Can we stop and pray just a minute? Jesus, this feels like a really important moment in the life of our church. Jesus, I would even use the word pivotal. pivotal moment in the life of our church. A 
for those in this room who've grown up in a church somewhere, for those of us in this room who've, who've grown up in any church, who've, who've spent time in any church where abuse or misuse or neglect of the body of Christ and the spiritual gifts, where that's happened, God, would you bring healing that only you can bring? And at the same time, God, would you protect us? The body of Christ at Caldersport Alliance Church, would you protect us from leading in ways that would be abusive, or misusing, or neglecting of these spiritual gifts you've given to us? That's my prayer, Jesus. Healing for those who hurt. and correction for us who need it with regards to spiritual gifts, I pray. Amen. So here's the thing. Spiritual gifts are dangerous. Just going to say it out loud. Spiritual gifts are dangerous. Either for good or for evil. Spiritual gifts can be used in such a way to battle the kingdom of darkness, to battle the kingdom of the world in ways that we could never do as humans, right? Romans talks about this like unseen spiritual forces of evil at work. Ephesians does as well. That, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers of dark, this dark world, right? Scripture is very clear that there's, there's really, there's two realities going on. There's the human reality that you and I most of the time, unless uh, we choose to check out of it, are, are pretty much functioning in. And then there's this unseen reality, the spiritual reality. And I believe that spiritual gifts have tremendous power. And are, in fact, dangerous for good or dangerous for evil. And when spiritual gifts are used well, when they're used with this, with this posture of surrender, when they're used with this kind of open-handedness before God, when God is, is calling us, empowering us, filling us, when we're walking close to Jesus, these spiritual gifts, they are dangerous for what is known as the spiritual kingdom of the world, Right? The kingdom that stands against Jesus. And lives begin to change, and marriages begin to change, and, and futures begin to change, and pasts get forgiven and healed, right? Like, there's some real power in spiritual gifts. Because it's not from us, right? The whole point of spiritual gift is that we get to do something for God and for the church and for the community that we could not do on our own. That we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit to do it. And that at the very same time, spiritual gifts have been historically in the context of the church, unfortunately, for thousands of years, used for evil. And I want to walk us through this, okay? I want to walk us through this this morning, a couple different scriptures I want to be really clear about and give you some examples of what, what spiritual abuse and misuse and neglect looks like in scripture and maybe in the context of the church. But, dear friends, I ask you, please, to guard your heart and to help me guard mine because I love the body of Christ with all of its flaws. I care very much about the church universal, not just this church. I care very much about the full body of Christ. And so I want to be really, really careful that the things I'm sharing with you are designed to be instructive and corrective, that they're designed to be future casting, restorative, not punitive, not something where I'm just throwing words around to make other churches look bad. If that happens today, I give you permission. Talk to the elders, talk to me. I want to be real careful here because spiritual gifts, they're dangerous. So this is not my attempt to put down the body of Christ, okay? Or any specific church or any specific type of church, okay? The other thing I want you to know... It's a phrase my dad used to use often. When something bad would happen in somebody's life that he knew, when somebody would make a really foolish decision, when they would mess up their relationship with God or with people around them, 
My dad would often say, son, but for the grace of God, go I. But for the grace of God, go I. And what he meant was, when I was real little, I didn't understand. I was like, go I, what? That's not even English. But what my dad meant was, it's only by God's grace that I haven't messed up like that guy messed up. At least not yet. So, I'll just be real transparent. I have seen the enemy, and the enemy is me. (laughs) I've seen the problem, and the problem is in me, right? The abuse of spiritual gift, the misuse of spiritual gift, the neglects of spiritual gift. This is is in all of us, the potential, because we're flawed, and we're human, and we're not where we're supposed to be yet. But I want to give you two primary determiners whether or not spiritual gifts are used for good or for evil, okay? There's two main categories. You ready? Number one is our motivation. I'll ask you this question. What is the real reason that we want to have or to use a spiritual gift? And guess what, friends? We are self-deceived people. We believe that we're always doing things for the right reasons. None of us like start out going, you know what? I'm going to mess up this church. <laughs> right? Like that's, that's not a thing we do. But... The two things that determine whether or not spiritual gifts get used for good or for evil, the first one is motivation. And so what is the real reason? What is the reason behind the reason behind the reason behind the reason that you want that spiritual gift, that you want to be able to use that spiritual gift, that you want to be known as having that spiritual gift? Because that's what makes spiritual gifts dangerous, right? Because they're gifts, and they're from God, and nobody else gets to decide but God. But we can use it in ways that make ourselves look good and in ways that don't make God look so good. Motivation is the first question behind whether or not a spiritual gift is used for good or for evil. And the other one is where does the source of strength come from? Here's my question. Are you using your own strength or the strength that the Holy Spirit provides when you exercise that spiritual gift? Is it just coming from you? Is it just you working extra hard? Is it just you giving more, making all the effort to make the changes? Or is the Holy Spirit literally empowering you Breathing through you. Okay, I want to share one verse with you. That It's actually a couple of verses. It's one section. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about this question of, like, of the motivation and the source of our strength. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to give you verses 1 through 5. And notice, okay, just stop for a second. Re- remember who Paul is, right? Remember that, that, like, the man that used to be Saul, he was, like, super important, And the religious leaders of Jesus' day, he was like very good at what he knew. He was extremely well-educated. He spoke multiple languages. He, He had the respect of his community. And arguably the greatest missionary in human history wrote just about half of the New Testament. Okay, So that Paul, just so you know, Started churches all over the place, three different missionary journeys. This incredibly spirit-filled man of God writes these things about the way that he led. Okay, so this is, this is Paul reminding the Corinthians about his leadership. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Okay, so he's saying, I didn't use my strength. I didn't use my words. Verse 2, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Oh, I could spend six months in that statement. (laughs) For I resolved, I put it in the depth of my soul to know nothing. No gifts, no talents, no abilities, no powers. No influence except Jesus Christ and his Crucifixion. Verse 3, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. That does not sound like super Paul, okay? It doesn't sound like the Paul that like shipwrecks and beatings and snake bites and like miracle after miracle after miracle, right? That does not sound like the Paul that we read about in Scripture. But this is what he's saying. This is his self-revelation. This is, this is what Paul believes And and Paul demonstrated to the church at Corinth, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's 
power. He's saying, like, it wasn't my power. It wasn't my strength. It wasn't my words. But the power of the Holy Spirit, so that, and then he gives us the reason why, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Okay, so by God's grace, one of the things that I, I got back from the surveys on the peak survey, one of the consistent themes was how much you appreciate my preaching. But I think that's really dangerous. I know it is. Because it's in all of us to rely on someone else's power, someone else's wisdom, someone else's understanding of Scripture. And so I'm just going to offer a word of caution. Anything that comes from my mouth that is not from Jesus, by God's grace, let that go. Anything that comes from my mouth that, that isn't empowered by the Holy Spirit, it's worthless. So what, what Paul illustrates for us is that the thing that determines whether or not our spiritual gift is used for good or for evil is, is our motivation. Why are we doing it, right? Paul had all kinds of reasons. He could have been traveling around and starting all these churches and influencing all these people, right? There's, there's a myriad of reasons why Paul could have been doing what he was doing. But he said it was because of Christ crucified, right? The love of Christ compels him, he says, in a different part of Scripture. I love how um, J. Oswald Sanders says it. He says, As the Christ follower gives control of their life to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit's power flows through them to others. That, that's like at the core of spiritual gifts. As we give over control of our lives, our agendas, our time, our energy, our future, our desires, our dreams, our hopes, our insecurities, as we give more of ourselves over to the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does, His power flows through us to other people. When spiritual gifts are used for good, this is what's happening, right? We're surrendering our wisdom, our abilities, our strength. We're giving those over to God, and then the Holy Spirit is working through us, okay? Again, there is a shadow side to the spiritual gifts. This is what I just, again, over and over and over throughout this week, God just kept pressing on my heart. Our church needs to know that there is a shadow side to spiritual gifts. There's tremendous power in the gifts to be used either for good or for evil. And the difference is our motivation and our source of strength. Now let me give you just, I want to give you a couple of examples. But before I do that, I, I want to flesh this out just a minute, okay? There is a shadow side to the spiritual gifts. And I'll say it this way. Love for God must be our primary motivation, right? As, as Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians that... He re resolved to know nothing but Christ's power. Right? His love demonstrated on the cross. So love for God must be our primary motivation in order for the spiritual gifts to be used for good. And the Holy Spirit must be our primary source of strength. Okay, I'm, anything less, okay? Anything less than a love for God and an empowerment of the Holy Spirit leaves us exposed to the spiritual forces of evil that are right there waiting to mess up our lives. Leaves us exposed to the shadow side of spiritual gifts. Okay, we're going to spend most of our time this morning in 1 Peter chapter 4, looking at verse 8. If you've done your homework, you know that this is one of the chapters that I assigned so that you could get to know the spiritual gifts according to Scripture. So 1 Peter 4, he reveals just very, very clear. What I'm going to ask you to watch for, okay? Watch for what Peter says our love should look like and our power should look like, okay? 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11, watch for the words love and power, okay? Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Okay, so he just finished giving these examples of spiritual gifts. Prophecy and healing, and I forget all the ones that are in there. Oh, don't quote me on this. But he just gave this list of, of, of spiritual gifts and how to use them. Right? And then he says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. The motivation that, that Peter is challenging us with, it's love. Love for God and love for others. That is, is at the core of what spiritual gifts used for good looks like. 
Verse 11, if anyone speaks, they should do as one speaking the very words of God. I've read that so many times in my life. But how many times have I actually done that? How many times have you known in your soul that what you're saying to somebody else aren't, is not your words, but the very words of God spoken through you? That, that's what the Holy Spirit does when, when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Our words are no longer our words, they're God's words. Verse 11, if anyone speaks, they should do as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. The danger here, I said spiritual gifts are dangerous. The danger is if there are words and there are strength and it's for our motivations and for our own good, then Jesus Christ isn't glorified, right? Like Jesus isn't the center anymore. We become the center when we make spiritual gifts about us. Peter's challenging us. All right, let me give you some examples, okay? A couple examples of the shadow side of spiritual gifts that I want you to see from Scripture because we are human and we are flawed and the church has, has a history of, of messing up at times, failing God and each other. There is a shadow side of spiritual gifts. I, I want to start with this one about abuse, okay? Okay? Abuse of spiritual gifts, I'm going to give you two very clear examples. The first one is Ananias and Sapphira, okay? Anybody heard of them? Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. All right, about 80% of the room. Cool. So um, here's what was happening. I don't remember if I have the scripture. I do. Um, So what was happening in the context of the church at the time, uh, the Holy Spirit had kind of moved very specifically in the life of the early church, and people were starting to, like, give things away that they wouldn't normally give away. This is verse 34 of Acts chapter 4. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it all at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. So this is you know, an example of the spiritual gift of giving. Right? Not everybody sold everything they had and gave it away, because guess what? Then everybody needs something. Right? So what was happening is that the Holy Spirit fell on the individuals and empowered certain individuals in such a way that they were called to take things that they had that was belonging to them and to give it up for the benefit of the local church, right? That's, that's the context. And then in verse um, 36, there's a specific man that's described. An example, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Who's that guy? You know who that is? One of Paul's closest compatriots throughout that book of Acts. This is the first time we hear about Barnabas. Barnabas the encourager, Barnabas the giver. So Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, sold a field that he owned, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man, this is verse 1, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. He kept back part of the money for himself, But he brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you, verse 4, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings but to God. Okay, so Ananias and Sapphira saw the notoriety, how famous Barnabas became because he gave away something that belonged to him. And he did it by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And Ananias and, and Sapphira are like, huh, wow, that made Barnabas pretty important. I'd like to be important, so why don't I do something like that too? It's really a summary, 21st century summary of what happened. But Ananias and Sapphira thought like, hey, I want to get in on this, this fame, this notoriety, this, this appreciation from our community. So let's go sell some stuff. And we're going to tell the apostles that this is all the money, but really it's not. And you know what happened to them? Whoosh. Literally, God took the life from their bodies in that moment. It's one of those. Remember what I said at the beginning? Spiritual gifts are dangerous. Ananias and Sapphira proved that very clearly. They abused the spiritual gift, and it cost them their lives. 
Got another one. Example of abuse I want to give you. Simon the sorcerer. He doesn't become Barnabas, okay? But Simon the sorcerer, Acts chapter 8, okay? In Acts chapter 8, Simon decides he's going to trust in Jesus. He actually gets baptized, like with water. Don't, don't whoop, come back up, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So this man makes a decision to follow Jesus. He gets baptized, and then he sees a couple of the disciples doing some of these amazing miracles, like using their spiritual gifts in incredible ways. And guess what Simon the sorcerer decides to do? Do you know? He goes up to the disciples. He's like, hey, can I pay you for that? That's what he says. Look, verse 18, when Simon saw the Spirit was given at the, at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And he said, give me also this ability so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money die with you, fool. <laughs> right? You're dumb. That's really, I mean, that's not in Scripture, but it's my interpretation. That's the Josh-inspired version, okay? Peter looks at him like, may your money just... And your money die with your foolishness. Again, this is somebody who had a personal relationship with Jesus. Simon the sorcerer. Like, he had a relationship with Jesus. He, he got baptized. But in his heart, he wanted that power. Because spiritual gifts are dangerous. Because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Remember, first week I said, if you think you can earn it, or if you think you deserve it, then you no longer qualify for a spiritual gift. Two very clear examples of, of, of abuse in the context of the church. Ananias and Sapphira and Simon the sorcerer. Okay, how about misuse of spiritual gifts in Scripture? Let me give you an example. You ready for this one? The entire Corinthian church. <laughs> the entire church at Corinth. Okay, let me just give you a couple examples. Um, in the church of Corinth, according to 1 Corinthians, I can give you the verses later if you want them, uh, the church members were getting drunk during communion. You can laugh. They're dumb. They still use regular wine at communion. So they were getting drunk at communion. Inside the church, they were suing each other regularly because of things they didn't like. One of them was sleeping with his father's wife, which was his stepmother, and the rest of the group thought this was something to be proud of. Yes, thank you, Rebecca Grace. I agree with that question. <laughs> Wait, what? Sorry. I totally use your name in service, and I shouldn't have. Um, literally, this is true. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. One of them was sleeping with his father's wife, his stepmother, and the rest of the group thought it was okay. They were approving of it. They were celebrating it. Here's another one. Some of them in the Corinthian church, they, they didn't know any better. These Christians actually called Jesus cursed, according to 1 Corinthians 12. I'll give you all those verses if you want them. But the entire Corinthian church was misusing the spiritual gifts. They were getting drunk at communion. They were suing each other. They were sleeping around and celebrating. <sighs> Makes us sound really good, actually. <laughs> I feel better about our church already. <laughs> God forgive me for that pride. But, like, truth is, the abuse and misuse of spiritual gifts, you can see it throughout all of Scripture. And, and just, just the church of Corinth. And do you know where the longest recorded teaching on spiritual gifts is found? In the Bible? Corinthians. Some of you did your homework. Your, your lips are moving, I can tell. Three chapters. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Paul talks all about the spiritual gifts to that kind of church. Misusing, abusing spiritual gifts. All right, last one. The neglect of spiritual gifts. So sometimes the spiritual gifts get abused. Sometimes the spiritual gifts get misused. And sometimes in the context of Scripture, people just neglect. They, they don't use them the way that God intended them to use them. And the example I want to give you is in actually young Timothy. So Timothy was a guy, when he first started hanging out with Paul, he was probably about 17, 18 years old. Most theologians would say he probably hadn't even graduated high school if they had high school, which they didn't, but that's another story. Timothy was this young man who had spent a lot of time with Paul. And he traveled with Paul. And in a couple different places, Paul left Timothy behind to help pastor a church at like 18, 19, 20 years old. Young dude. Pastor in a church. And two different times, 
Paul had to write back to Timothy and talk to him about neglecting his spiritual gifts. 1 Timothy 4.15, this is the first time Paul says it to him. He says, do not neglect your gift, Timothy, which was given to you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Right? So Paul's just reminding him, hey, this really happened. You did receive a spiritual gift. The elder, remember that time? And, and what, was, what Timothy was doing, he was afraid to use this gift. Maybe he was young. Maybe he was immature. Maybe he didn't want to seem like he was more powerful than the older people in his church. Who knows why? But, but he wasn't using the gift that God had given to him. And this isn't the only time. 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. For this reason, I remind you, this is a whole book later, right? A whole another letter. This is probably five or six years later, Paul's writing to Timothy. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit God, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. So two different times, young Timothy had, had neglected the gifts that the Holy Spirit had given to him. And we're not exactly sure why, but he did. Friends, there is a shadow side to spiritual gifts. They can be abused. They can be misused. They can be neglected. And some of you in this room, you've been a part of churches where, where spiritual gifts weren't used in love. You've been a part of churches where spiritual gifts were mimicked, faked even sometimes. Where some people like said they had the spiritual gift, but they just really wanted to control the church or the people around them. We've been part of churches that, that people were saying they're using their spiritual gift, but they were just kind of doing it on their own power. See, that's, that's, the, that's one of the dangers. It's one of the dangers of the spiritual gifts, knowing that our motivation must be love for God, and our source of strength must be the Holy Spirit. Jesus even said this. Jesus even said about about guarding our hearts against the temptation to use spiritual gifts for our own gain, right? Mark 10, 42, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You ever thought about what it would look like if Jesus had abused his own spiritual gifts? Do you ever think about how much like, damage could have been done in the world if Jesus hadn't chose to surrender himself to the Holy Spirit? Did you notice that Jesus didn't do one miracle until the Holy Spirit descended at his baptism? Jesus didn't preach one thing publicly, didn't do one public teaching, didn't do one miracle until the Holy Spirit came upon him at the baptism. Right? The skies open up. The Father speaks from heaven, my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Right? Even Jesus waited for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because he knew that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In fact, that, that whole, that whole like, idea that, that Jesus didn't do anything any miracles, didn't do any teaching until the Holy Spirit came on him. That was like a core part of the early church. Acts chapter 10, it gets recorded, right? You know what happened through the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So the early church reinforced like, hey, Jesus didn't do that alone but through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So are we greater than our Lord Jesus Christ? Are we more important? Are we more powerful, educated, wise than Jesus? Can we do any effective ministry without the Spirit of God working through us long term? Paul puts it this way, Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Love must be the source of our motivation. Love for God and love for others. 
Okay, so here's my challenge. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to invite you to, to take, I put it back in your um, worship folders, the bulletin this morning. I, I put another copy of the 18 spiritual gifts we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. What I'm going to invite you to do is actually to go through this coming week and take these 18 different gifts and would you write down specifically what happens if someone abuses, misuses, or neglects these gifts? You know, I don't know if you can see it from out there, but I, I went through mine. I, I used red pen. Because you and I, we need to be aware of the fact that there, there is a shadow side to spiritual gifts, and they are dangerous, and they can be used for good or for evil. And, and I just want us to wrestle with, like, okay, so what happens when somebody takes the spiritual gift of discernment and abuses it or misuses it or, or neglects it? What happens when somebody takes administration or faith or giving? I just invite you in this, in this next week, take this home with you. Spend some time. It took me about, I don't know, 10 minutes. Because just stop and pray, hey, Jesus, can you show me what it looks like when, when the spiritual gifts like this get misused or abused? The goal is to empower you, to equip you to be able to recognize that there is a shadow side to spiritual gifts and that love must be our motivation and that the Holy Spirit must be our primary source of strength. Our primary source of power must be from Him. Anything less leaves us exposed to the shadow side of spiritual gifts.